family, it's Carlos Watson back with a terrific episode. Now, as we round towards the end of week one of season two, had to have a little bit of comedy in our lives. I've always loved Kathy Griffin. Who else would say that they were on the D list? Gotta like someone like that. All kinds of funny and more than a little bit controversial. I know you know a little bit about the Donald Trump scandal. She's here to talk at exactly the right time as we get ready to celebrate the holidays and a whole lot more. Enjoy it. Tell me what you think on the other side. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I feel like this should have happened before. Years ago, decades ago, I tell you. (laughs) Uh, I've said of you before that I feel like you're more fun than is legal, which I like. (laughs) Well, I've almost been, you know, um, institutionalized for it. So I'm ready to make you laugh whatever you want. I lo- now, were you were you funny as a little kid? Like, if I had met you as a kid, were you funny back then? I believe the word we used then was obnoxious, but let's go with funny. <laughs> and the Emmy goes to... Kathy Griffin. Kathy Griffin, my life on the d Kathy Griffin, my life on the d Do you believe this <laughs> Suck it, Jesus! This award is my God, no! <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you! You know, I'm very imperfect, but damn it, I'm prolific. And um, I've done 23 televised stand-up comedy specials. I'm in the Guinness Book of World Records for having done more uh, televised stand-up specials than any comedian, male or female, living or dead. And so when that's your gig, you just, you come up with a lot of stuff. So I also love to do about the first 15 minutes of a show based on whatever happened that day. So I'm checking my phone, checking my laptop until the minute I go on stage. And you know, when you make fun of celebrities as much as I do, Sometimes you have to make sure no one died at five to eight, <laughs> which has happened. <laughs> oh yes, Celine Dion. <laughs> Married to René Angelil. <laughs> who is gambling away her millions right now. When, when did, and when did you break through? Like you knew you were funny earlier, you liked it, but like when was this no longer just something you were doing for fun, but like you were, this was your job, this was who, who you were, at least what you got to do. Are you gonna make me go over my iconic Fresh Prince of Bel-Air episode? I worked for free for so many years. You know, I'm from Chicago and in Chicago, they don't play with the like, you work for free. And so no one, and, you know, my relatives and stuff couldn't understand why I would be doing a student film for free or I was in the Groundlings Comedy Improv Group, which was just an amazing ground uh, training ground. And <laughs> <laughs> worked with some of the great comics and uh, improvisers, and then I went on to teach. That was my day job for a while, but honestly, I did the grind for years until I got a paying gig. I mean, years. Like, I wasn't even on a work show until I was like 36 or 35, and so I was trying and trying and trying, and then in one year, I got guest spots on Ellen, Seinfeld. Doing Jerry now, okay? So you have to imagine I have horns, a tail, and hooves instead of feet. And then eventually they had the show Suddenly Susan with Brooke Shields where they needed the funny sidekick, huh? <laughs> and like every other gig I've ever had, they had another chick do the pilot. She got canned and they were desperate, so I got the job. The photographer is a really good friend of mine. Which is why it would probably take considerably more than the 1200 she paid for it to pry it away from her. <laughs> and then I got to do my own show on MTV for a season called Kathy Griffin's So-Called Reality, ahead of its time. And then um, <laughs> finally I got the My Life on the D-List show. And honestly, that's the show that brought the Emmy Awards and all the kind of like respectful recognition. And that's really that's really the show that helps me. And kind of to this day, I, I just love when people love that show or ask me about the D-List or on the street, hey D-List, I'm like, that's me, baby. All I know is Team Griffin has less than 24 hours to convert this place from a hole into a place where old people want a sh**. I pooped myself. They said, we think we can follow you around with a camera for almost nothing and make a show. And so that's what led to my life on the D-list. And at first I wasn't sure if a reality show could be funny, but I always thought, well, what if I could try to do a reality show that's really a sitcom in disguise? And that's what I tried to do. So I was, you know, I, I knew my mom and dad were naturals. And I was so glad I put them on the show to the point where they were so popular that every time they focus group the show, the network would come back and go, your parents have to be in every episode. And I was like, of course, they're Irish cat alcoholics. Everything they say is funny. There's no filter. <laughs> oh, and of course, CNN and Anderson Cooper 
Oh, you don't know how devastating that was to me. Really angry about that. All right. Who were your heroes growing up? Like, which comedians did you laugh at, did you laugh with and enjoy? You know, I'm not a comedy snob. I've always loved all kinds of comedy. So first of all, I grew up on like, you know, when I was a little kid, it was the Ed Sullivan Show and records. So, you know, we had the, like the Cheech and Chong records and that was a really big deal. And, you know, when I would think about the early Tonight Show and stuff, it was whoever made me laugh. But of course, of course I have an affinity for the women. So it was, you know, Moms Mabley and Phyllis Diller and Joan Rivers, who I later had the honor of becoming very good friends with. And I always was looking to see when the women got to be funny. And I also love the great sidekicks, you know, Phyllis on the Mary Tyler Moore Show, Rhoda on the Mary Tyler Moore Show. Ethel. I mean, Lucy was amazing. I wanted to be Ethel. So I really always loved and admired the women that could come in, get their jokes, let the pretty girl do the heavy lifting, and then leave. You know how you get to Carnegie Hall? You the guy that I like say I noticed right away that you also, you do physical comedy with your eyes and with your face. Did you do that naturally as a kid, or is that something you uh, you learned as you got serious about comedy? You know, I think I may have honed those skills at Catholic school because, you know, when the nuns are always up your butt, you know, uh, and I mean that literally, no. Uh, you know, you learn to do whatever you can with your facial expressions to avoid the ruler, as they used to say. So yes, I'm big on facial expressions and uh, I get physical when I can, you know, so if I'm doing one of my specials and I get to roll out on, on the stage, that's fun as well. But I'm all about the facial expressions. I like the side eye, I like the eye roll. They're all in my toolbox. Tonight when I go to bed with one of you, tonight when I go to bed, <laughs> yes, and I lie down, my boobs are gonna be underneath my armpits where they belong. <laughs> All right, so now take me around the country. Like, where is fun to play? Or who has, like, unique audience or a tough audience or, you know, whatever. Like, take me around the country a little bit. LA is the toughest. And I live in Los Angeles now. I'm from Chicago, but I live in LA. And LA's audiences are so rough. They're so jaded. They're like, oh, please, we can go to, you know, a, a talk show taping. We can go see a celebrity in a sitcom taking, taping, or we can see, you know, a celebrity at the grocery store. And so uh, there's a lot, a lot of industry folks too. Notorious for not laughing, notorious for coming late. So, uh, oh, and everybody wants a free ticket in LA. Everybody, like my doctor calls me, you know, my shrink who I give at least 400 bucks a week to, God <laughs> love him, he's busy. And you know, and yet they all want comps, right? I'm not paying. And then they don't want to stand in line. I had to wait in line for my free ticket. Can you imagine? And I brought my whore. That was embarrassing for me. When I say whore, I say it with love. I mean, working girl and God love her. She's in the oldest industry in the world. The point is, LA is a little rough. I, I'm also so proud of the shows I've done at Carnegie Hall in, in New York, where I, I like to think I've made um, that venue a little more, how shall I say, casual for the evening. So I'm not exactly, you know, the fourth cello when I play Carnegie, but it's always an honor. Do you get nervous? No. I get excited. The most famous book about people become presidents um, called What It Takes says that in the end, you have to just get completely comfortable with yourself because there's going to be so much scrutiny that you have to be okay being a rich man's son, Donald Trump or W, or you've got to be okay being a half black kid from Hawaii or whatever, but you've got to kind of be comfortable in your own skin. How, how did you get so comfortable, or at least you seem really, com I mean, I don't know if it's an act, but you seem really comfortable, as comfortable as anyone I've met. I kind of like this. Like, I'm one of those people when people are like, are you always this on? I'm like, yeah, kind of. An artist prepares. But you know, I, I think that that's where I'm just comfortable being that person. You know what I mean? So I'd love to be able to put on airs and I'd love to affect an accent or something, but I'm just not the girl who can get away with that. And so I, I love real comedy, you know? And if I go to see a comedian or watch a special or what I think of the greats, if I think about watching Richard Pryor. Driver, I want to go to 78th Street. Driver says, I'm not going that way. <laughs> I think, I feel like I got to know him a little bit at the end of that special. I don't know if that's true or not, but you know, I, I like artists that expose themselves for who they are. And I don't really want to see an artifice at th that moment. And so, it, you know, I do this kind of comedy because it's really the only kind I know how to do. Hey, nice move. Come on. Um, I'd like to be more snobby and fake. I, I just don't know how.
There is no situation that doesn't need comedy. Oh, sorry about Trump. He's crazy. Fans everywhere. Are you, when you're in the South, can you make fun of someone like Trump in front of Trump supporters? Like, do they laugh? Or like, how do they relate to when you might be poking fun at like their people? You know, there's been honestly a night and day reaction be from before my Trump photo scandal and after. Griff was making headlines this morning. She posted graphic photos of herself holding a severed, decapitated head of President Trump. And she deserves everything that's coming to her. So number one, I've known Trump off and on for decades. So when he announced that he was even running, all of a sudden I had all these Trump jokes and these stories about, you know, sitting next to him at a roast in Manhattan or a part of two challenges on The Apprentice. And I spent this crazy day with him in his like dumb golf course for part of an episode with Liza Minnelli. Like it's actually a great story, but to tell you the truth, nobody really wanted to hear about Donald Trump prior to really 2015 or 2016. Prior to my photo scandal, everybody loved those stories because number one, I, I don't think the Trump cult was quite as indoctrinated. And number two, people were kind of letting themselves laugh at him. And in my opinion, he wasn't really showing himself to be as dangerous as in my opinion, he has shown himself to be. So. It kind of makes me sad because the same folks who, you know, whatever they think about me now, because I'm polarizing, <laughs> those same folks were more than happy to hear about what it's like to spend a day with the Donald. You know, <laughs> on my on my last tour, the Kathy Griffin Laugh Your Head Off tour, I actually had incidents with Trump supporters. I had a guy pull a knife on me. I had several security incidents. You know, it was a whole different ball game when I went on tour after the photo scandal, and yet, I've never sold so many tickets in my life. I got to play Radio City Music Hall for the first time in my career the night after I sold out Carnegie Hall. I got to tour the world and play countries I would never play. All right, let's see how long till someone notices. Get it? It's me. Take a picture, don't be I'm now drawn into like every scandal from, you know, I'm a member of ISIS. I don't know if you've heard this, Carlos. Very believable, very believable. So, you know, I've kind of heard it all at this point, so you gotta laugh. The death threat started the day of the photo. I died laughing, now I hope you die, you c I'm quite sure this is from one of my aunts in Chicago. Tell me what that's like to actually be in the crosshairs of, because he isn't just a re reality show contestant. He was the 45th commander in chief. He's in charge of the military and, you know, the Justice Department, all that sort of stuff. I'm going to be honest, he broke me. He broke me. I would say it was very real because, you know, I think I'm kind of the first, like the first person that Trump went for, certainly who was at least a civilian. And of course he goes for, you know, a female comedian and, you know, private citizen, uh, actually the first private citizen in the history of the country to um, not at all violate the first amendment. And I've got many, many large lawyer bills to prove it. Um, but what happened was after the photo scandal, not only did he tweet about me and then um, enlisted the whole first family, but he actually instructed the department of justice to put me under under a legitimate federal investigation by two federal agencies, the Secret Service and the U.S. Attorney's Office. I was detained at every single airport that I went to. I was held for six hours. <laughs> and obviously it's getting to me. And uh, they were considering charging me with the crime of conspiracy to assassinate the president of the United States, which holds a lifetime sentence. So I can certainly make a lot of jokes about it. And I've, I've done a tour based on it. I've made a film and the whole thing, but it was also very real at the same time. I wish you could have seen like our study sessions for my interrogation. I mean, it was like, they had to have like a light bulb flying above me, like, no, do not make dick jokes. And I was like, oh, come on. Um, but ultimately it did become very real and it kind of goes on in some ways, but it's definitely been an amazing learning lesson. And it's given me some, I like to say comedically, it's actually put more meat on the bone. And so in a way I, I really have loved you know, making the film and touring with this material. And believe it or not, wherever I go, people still ask me about the Trump photo more than anything. And my good friend, fellow dissident and resistor Jane Fonda said, kid, this is gonna be on your tombstone. So I've come to accept it. Kathy Griffin, everybody. And your headliner. Your headliner is here. And so what does your boy Anderson say? Cause you guys were like this, and then all of a sudden yeah. you were canceled out of that. Like, what does he say now? Does he, is he like roll his eyes and say, okay, you'll be back in a year? Or like, what does he say? 
I don't know. I think he says thoughts and prayers. I'm not sure. I mean, <laughs> I'm banned for life from CNN. For life. And first of all, I never worked there. I had one night a year there. And second of all, I was like, even when I'm dead, like obituaries, no. I get in trouble more than anything. I've been fired more than I've been hired. And I will say that's probably made me more fearless. So I don't know if the cancellation worked. Like, I don't know if it took. I'm probably gonna be canceled a few more times because they're trying to cancel me and I'm like re-emerging. So, you know, I don't know what to tell you, but I'm like, you know, I'm like the uh, Night of the Living Dead a little. I'm a little bit of a comedy zombie. You know, you better get the knife right in the eye or else I'm coming back. I'm still canceled, you know, most places. Am I canceled from this interview or are we still talking? <laughs> You're not, we're still good. We're, we're still happy. <laughs>
Also, you know, I mean, I've had a little work done, but that one really cleans my clock in that department. I mean, she looks very different than she used to. Last but not least, yours truly, Carlos Watson. Adorable. Too good for this bulge. When does my check come? <laughs> This was a joy, and, and your check will be coming soon. So, uh... <laughs> I mean, I'm an artist, but I'm kind of in it for the money. I look for brands. You know, I'd love some gold. Um, all right, well, you're fantastic, and your show is great, and that's why you're doing so well. So, honestly, thank you so much. This has been a pleasure, and you're great, and I hope to see you in real life someday. Hey family, I hope you didn't mind me laughing with Kathy as much as I did, but she's just all kinds of funny. She's exactly my kind of person, just inappropriate. I mean that in the best sense of the word and just uh, all over the place, which I thought was great. What a quick mind, what a sharp mind. I love that she didn't make it till she was in her kind of mid to late 30s. I think something happens to you when that's the case. You appreciate the moment even more. You guys are gonna meet Takashi Murakami if you haven't already the famous artist who's got kind of a similar story and it's interesting what it does to you. In any case, I hope you enjoy Kathy. Keep your eye on her during the Biden era. Not sure there's as much material there, but she'll make it funny somehow. Um, I'm enjoying you guys. Thank you so much for being here. Don't forget to subscribe. Tell your people about this show, please, please, please. And listen to the podcast. In fact, the Kathy Griffin podcast, it's like a stand-up comedy special. Do not miss it. <laughs>